Margaret Hilda Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher, née Roberts, the 13th of October 1925 to the 8th of April 2013, was a British stateswoman who served as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1979 to 1990 and leader of the Conservative Party from 1975 to 1990. She was the longest-serving British Prime Minister of the 20th century and the first woman to hold that office. A Soviet journalist dubbed her the Iron Lady a nickname that became associated with her uncompromising politics and leadership style. As Prime Minister, she implemented policies known as Thatcherism. A research chemist at Somerville College, Oxford, before becoming a barrister, Thatcher was elected Member of Parliament for Finchley in 1959. Edward Heath appointed her Secretary of State for Education and Science in his Conservative government. In 1975, Thatcher defeated Heath in the Conservative Party leadership election to become leader of the opposition, the first woman to lead a major political party in the United Kingdom. She became Prime Minister after winning the 1979 general election. Thatcher introduced a series of economic policies intended to reverse high unemployment and Britain's struggles in the wake of the winter of discontent and an ongoing recession. Her political philosophy and economic policies emphasized deregulation particularly of the financial sector, flexible labor markets, the privatization of state-owned companies, and reducing the power and influence of trade unions. Thatcher's popularity in her first years in office waned amid recession and rising unemployment, until victory in the 1982 Falklands War and the recovering economy brought a resurgence of support, resulting in her decisive re-election in 1983. She survived an assassination attempt in the Brighton Hotel bombing in 1984. Thatcher was re-elected for a third term in 1987, but her subsequent support for the community charge, poll tax, was widely unpopular, and her views on the European community were not shared by others in her cabinet. She resigned as Prime Minister and Party Leader in November 1990, after Michael Heseltine launched a challenge to her leadership. After retiring from the Commons in 1992, she was given a life peerage as Baroness Thatcher of Kesteven in the county of Lincolnshire, which entitled her to sit in the House of Lords. In 2013, she died of a stroke in London at the age of 87. Always a controversial figure, she is nonetheless viewed favourably in historical rankings of British Prime Ministers, and her tenure constituted a realignment towards neoliberal policies in the United Kingdom. Despite the passage of time, debate over the complicated legacy of Thatcherism persists. <laughs> Early life and education Margaret Hilda Roberts was born on 13 October 1925, in Grantham, Lincolnshire. Her parents were Alfred Roberts 1892 from Northamptonshire, and Beatrice Ethel nay Stevenson, 1888 from Lincolnshire. She spent her childhood in Grantham, where her father owned two grocery shops. In 1938, prior to the Second World War, the Roberts family briefly gave sanctuary to a teenage Jewish girl who had escaped Nazi Germany. Margaret and her pen-friending sister Muriel saved pocket money to help pay for the teenager's journey. Alfred Roberts was an alderman and a Methodist local preacher, and brought up his daughter as a strict Wesleyan Methodist, attending the Finken Street Methodist Church. He came from a liberal family but stood as was then customary in local government as an independent. He served as mayor of Grantham from 1945-46 and lost his position as alderman in 1952 after the Labour Party won its first majority on Grantham Council in 1950. Margaret Roberts attended Hunting Tower Road Primary School and won a scholarship to Kesteven and Grantham Girls School, a grammar school. Her school reports showed hard work and continual improvement. Her extracurricular activities included the piano, field hockey, poetry recitals, swimming and walking. She was head girl in 1942-43. In her upper sixth year she applied for a scholarship to study chemistry at University of Oxford Somerville College, a women's college at the time, but she was initially rejected and was offered a place only after another candidate withdrew. Roberts arrived at Oxford in 1943 and graduated in 1947 with second class honours, in the four year chemistry Bachelor of Science degree, specialising in X ray crystallography under the supervision of Dorothy Hodgkin. Her dissertation was on the structure of the antibiotic gramicidin. Thatcher did not devote herself entirely to studying chemistry as she only intended to be a chemist for a short period of time. 
Even when working on the subject, she was already thinking towards law and politics. She was reportedly more proud of becoming the first prime minister with a science degree than the first female prime minister, and as prime minister attempted to preserve Somerville as a women's college, during her time at Oxford, she was noted for her isolated and serious attitude. Her first boyfriend, Tony Bray 1926 recalled that she was "...very thoughtful and a very good conversationalist. That's probably what interested me. She was good at general subjects." Her enthusiasm for politics as a girl made him think of her as unusual. Bray met Robert's parents and described them as slightly austere and very proper. At the end of the term at Oxford, Bray gradually became more distant and hoped for their relationship to fizzle out. Bray later recalled that he thought Roberts had taken the relationship more seriously than he had done. When asked about Bray in later life, Thatcher prevaricated but acknowledged the circumstances between herself and Bray. Roberts became president of the Oxford University Conservative Association in 1946. She was influenced at university by political works such as Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, 1944, which condemned economic intervention by government as a precursor to an authoritarian state. Topic. Postgraduate career, 1947–1951 After graduating, Roberts moved to Colchester in Essex to work as a research chemist for BX Plastics near Manningtree. In 1948 she applied for a job at Imperial Chemical Industries but was rejected after the personnel department assessed her as "...headstrong, obstinate and dangerously self-opinionated." Professor John Ager argued that her understanding of modern scientific research impacted her views as Prime Minister. Roberts joined the local Conservative Association and attended the party conference at Landidno, Wales, in 1948, as a representative of the University Graduate Conservative Association. Meanwhile, she became a high ranking affiliate of the Vermin Club, a group of grassroots conservatives formed in response to a derogatory comment made by Anurin Bevan. One of her Oxford friends was also a friend of the chair of the Dartford Conservative Association in Kent, who were looking for candidates. Officials of the association were so impressed by her that they asked her to apply, even though she was not on the party's approved list. She was selected in January 1950, age 24, and added to the approved list post ante at a dinner following her formal adoption as conservative candidate for Dartford in February 1949. She met divorcee Dennis Thatcher, a successful and wealthy businessman, who drove her to her Essex train. After their first meeting, she described him to Muriel as not a very attractive creature, very reserved but quite nice." In preparation for the election Roberts moved to Dartford, where she supported herself by working as a research chemist for J. Lyons & Co., in Hammersmith, part of a team developing emulsifiers for ice cream. Shortly after her marriage to Dennis, she and her husband began attending Anglican services and would later convert to Anglicanism. Topic. Early political career In the 1950 and 1951 general elections, Roberts was the conservative candidate for the safe labor seat of Dartford. The local party selected her as its candidate because, though not a dynamic public speaker, Roberts was well prepared and fearless in her answers, prospective candidate Bill Deeds recalled. Once she opened her mouth, the rest of us began to look rather second rate. She attracted media attention as the youngest and the only female candidate. She lost on both occasions to Norman Dodds, but reduced the Labour majority by 6,000, and then a further 1,000. During the campaigns, she was supported by her parents and by future husband Dennis Thatcher, whom she married in December 1951. Dennis funded his wife's studies for the bar, she qualified as a barrister in 1953 and specialised in taxation. Later that same year their twins Carol and Mark were born, delivered prematurely by Caesarine section. Topic. Member of Parliament, 1959–1970 In 1954, Thatcher was defeated when she sought selection to be the Conservative Party candidate for the Orpington by-election of January 1955. She chose not to stand as a candidate in the 1955 general election, in later years stating, I really just felt the twins were only two, I really felt that it was too soon. I couldn't do that. 
Afterwards, Thatcher began looking for a conservative safe seat and was selected as the candidate for Finchley in April 1958 narrowly beating Ian Montagu Fraser. She was elected as MP for the seat after a hard campaign in the 1959 election. Benefiting from her fortunate result in a lottery for backbenchers to propose new legislation, Thatcher's maiden speech was, unusually, in support of her private member's bill the Public Bodies Admission to Meetings Act 1960, requiring local authorities to hold their council meetings in public. The bill was successful and became law. In 1961 she went against the Conservative Party's official position by voting for the restoration of birching as a judicial corporal punishment. Thatcher's talent and drive caused her to be mentioned as a future prime minister in her early twenties although she herself was more pessimistic, stating as late as 1970, "...there will not be a woman prime minister in my lifetime, the male population is too prejudiced." In October 1961 she was promoted to the front bench as parliamentary undersecretary at the Ministry of Pensions and National Insurance by Harold Macmillan. Thatcher was the youngest woman in history to receive such a post, and among the first MPs elected in 1959 to be promoted. After the Conservatives lost the 1964 election she became spokesman on housing and land, in which position she advocated her party's policy of allowing tenants to buy their council houses. She moved to the Shadow Treasury team in 1966 and, as Treasury spokesman, opposed Labour's mandatory price and income controls, arguing they would unintentionally produce effects that would distort the economy. By 1966, party leaders viewed Thatcher as a potential Shadow Cabinet member. Jim Pryor suggested her as a member after the Conservatives' 1966 defeat, but party leader Edward Heath and Chief Whip William Whitelaw eventually settled on Mervyn Pike as the Shadow Cabinet's sole woman member. At the 1966 Conservative Party conference, she criticized the high tax policies of the Labour government as being steps, not only towards socialism, but towards communism, arguing that lower taxes served as an incentive to hard work. Thatcher was one of the few conservative MPs to support Leo Abse's bill to decriminalize male homosexuality. She voted in favor of David Steele's bill to legalize abortion, as well as a ban on hair coursing. She supported the retention of capital punishment and voted against the relaxation of divorce laws. In 1967, the United States Embassy in London chose Thatcher to take part in the International Visitor Leadership Program, then called the Foreign Leader Program, a professional exchange program that gave her the opportunity to spend about six weeks visiting various U.S. cities and political figures as well as institutions such as the International Monetary Fund. Although she was not yet a shadow cabinet member, the embassy reportedly described her to the State Department as a possible future prime minister. The description helped Thatcher meet with prominent persons during a busy itinerary focused on economic issues, including Paul Samuelson, Walt Rostow, Pierre Paul Schweitzer and Nelson Rockefeller. Following the visit, Heath appointed Thatcher to the shadow cabinet as fuel and power spokesman. Prior to the 1970 general election, she was promoted to shadow transport spokesman and later to education. In 1968 Enoch Powell delivered his Rivers of Blood speech in which he strongly criticized Commonwealth immigration to the United Kingdom and the then proposed race relations bill. When Heath telephoned Thatcher to inform her that he was going to sack Powell from the shadow cabinet, she recalled that she really thought that it was better to let things cool down for the present rather than heighten the crisis. She believed that his main points about Commonwealth immigration were correct and that the selected quotations from his speech had been taken out of context. In a 1991 interview for Today, Thatcher stated that she thought Powell had made a valid argument, if in sometimes regrettable terms. Around this time she gave her first common speech as a shadow transport minister and highlighted the need for investment in British Rail. She argued. If we build bigger and better roads, they would soon be saturated with more vehicles and we would be no nearer solving the problem." Thatcher made her first visit to the Soviet Union in the summer of 1969 as the opposition transport spokeswoman, and in October delivered a speech celebrating her ten years in Parliament. A couple of months later, in early 1970, she told the Finchley Press that she would like to see a "...reversal of the permissive society." Topic. Education Secretary, 1970-1974 In 
The Conservative Party led by Edward Heath won the 1970 general election, and Thatcher was subsequently appointed to the cabinet as Secretary of State for Education and Science. Thatcher caused controversy when after only a few days in office she withdrew Labour's circular 1065 which attempted to force comprehensivization, without going through a consultation progress. She was highly criticised for the speed in which she carried this out. Consequently, she drafted her own new policy circular 1070 which ensured that a local authority was not forced to go comprehensive. Her new policy was not meant to stop the development of new comprehensives, she said, we shall. Expect plans to be based on educational considerations rather than on the comprehensive principle. Thatcher supported Lord Rothschild's 1971 proposal for market forces to affect government funding of research. Although many scientists opposed the proposal, her research background probably made her skeptical of their claim that outsiders should not interfere with funding. The department evaluated proposals for more local education authorities to close grammar schools and to adopt comprehensive secondary education. Although Thatcher was committed to a tiered secondary modern grammar school system of education and attempted to preserve grammar schools, during her tenure as Education Secretary she turned down only 326 of 3,612 proposals roughly 9% for schools to become comprehensives. The proportion of pupils attending comprehensive schools consequently rose from 32% to 62%. Nevertheless, she managed to save 94 grammar schools. During her first months in office she attracted public attention as a consequence of the government's attempts to cut spending. She gave priority to academic needs in schools, while administering public expenditure cuts on the state education system, resulting in the abolition of free milk for schoolchildren aged 7 to 11. She held that few children would suffer if schools were charged for milk, but agreed to provide younger children with one-third pint daily for nutritional purposes. She also argued that she was simply carrying on with what the Labour government had started since they had stopped giving free milk to secondary schools. Milk would still be provided to those children that required it on medical grounds and schools could still sell milk. The aftermath of the milk row hardened her determination, she told the editor-proprietor Harold Creighton of The Spectator, Don't underestimate me, I saw how they broke Keith Joseph, but they won't break me. Cabinet papers later revealed that she opposed the policy but had been forced into it by the Treasury. Her decision provoked a storm of protest from Labour and the press, leading to her being notoriously nicknamed, Margaret Thatcher, Milk Snatcher. She reportedly considered leaving politics in the aftermath and later wrote in her autobiography, I learned a valuable lesson from the experience. I had incurred the maximum of political odium for the minimum of political benefit. Topic. Leader of the Opposition, 1975–1979 The Heath Ministry continued to experience difficulties with oil embargoes and union demands for wage increases in 1973, subsequently losing the February 1974 general election. Labour formed a minority government and went on to win a narrow majority in the October 1974 general election. Heath's leadership of the Conservative Party looked increasingly in doubt. Thatcher was not initially seen as the obvious replacement, but she eventually became the main challenger, promising a fresh start. Her main support came from the Parliamentary 1922 Committee and The Spectator, but Thatcher's time in office gave her the reputation of a pragmatist rather than that of an ideologue. She defeated Heath on the first ballot and he resigned the leadership. In the second ballot she defeated Whitelaw, Heath's preferred successor. Thatcher's election had a polarizing effect on the party, as her support was stronger among MPs on the right, and also among those from southern England, and those who had not attended public schools or Oxbridge. Thatcher became Conservative Party leader and leader of the opposition on of February 1975, she appointed Whitelaw as her deputy. Heath was never reconciled to Thatcher's leadership of the party. Television critic Clive James, writing in The Observer two days prior to the second leadership ballot, compared her voice of 1973 to a cat sliding down a blackboard. Thatcher had already begun to work on her presentation on the advice of Gordon Rees, a former television producer. 
By chance, Rees met the actor Laurence Olivier, who arranged lessons with the National Theatre's voice coach. Thatcher began attending lunches regularly at the Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, a think tank founded by Hayekian poultry magnate Anthony Fisher. She had been visiting the IEA and reading its publications since the early 1960s. There she was influenced by the ideas of Ralph Harris and Arthur Selden, and became the face of the ideological movement opposing the British welfare state. Keynesian economics, they believed, was weakening Britain. The Institute's pamphlets proposed less government, lower taxes, and more freedom for business and consumers. Thatcher intended to promote neoliberal economic ideas at home and abroad. Despite setting the direction of her foreign policy for a conservative government, Thatcher was distressed by her repeated failure to shine in the House of Commons. Consequently, Thatcher decided that as her voice was carrying little weight at home, she would be heard in the wider world. Thatcher undertook visits across the Atlantic, establishing an international profile and promoting her economic and foreign policies. She toured the United States in 1975, and visited again in 1977, when she met U.S. President Jimmy Carter. Among other foreign trips, she met Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi during a visit to Iran in April 1978. Thatcher chose to travel without her shadow foreign secretary, Reginald Maudling, in an attempt to make a bolder personal impact. In domestic affairs, Thatcher opposed Scottish devolution home rule and the creation of a Scottish assembly. She instructed Conservative MPs to vote against the Scotland and Wales Bill in December 1976, which was successfully defeated, and then when new bills were proposed she supported amending the legislation to allow the English to vote in the 1979 referendum on Scottish devolution. Britain's economy during the 1970s was so weak that Foreign Secretary James Callaghan warned his fellow Labour cabinet members in 1974 of the possibility of a breakdown of democracy, telling them. If I were a young man, I would emigrate. In mid-1978, the economy began to recover and opinion polls showed Labour in the lead, with a general election being expected later that year and a Labour win a serious possibility. Now Prime Minister, Callaghan surprised many by announcing on 7 September that there would be no general election that year and he would wait until 1979 before going to the polls. Thatcher reacted to this by branding the Labour government, chickens and Liberal Party leader David Steele joined in, criticizing Labour for running scared. The Labour government then faced fresh public unease about the direction of the country and a damaging series of strikes during the winter of 1978-79, dubbed the Winter of Discontent. The Conservatives attacked the Labour government's unemployment record, using advertising with the slogan, Labour isn't working. A general election was called after the Callaghan ministry lost a motion of no confidence in early 1979. The Conservatives won a 44-seat majority in the House of Commons and Thatcher became the first female British Prime Minister. Topic. The Iron Lady sounds the alarm. I stand before you tonight in my red star chiffon evening gown, my face softly made up and my fair hair gently waved, the Iron Lady of the Western World. In 1976, Thatcher gave her Britain Awake foreign policy speech which lambasted the Soviet Union for seeking world dominance. The Soviet Army journal Krasnaya Zaveda red star rebutted her stance in a piece entitled Iron Lady Raises Fears by Captain Yuri Gavrilov alluding to Iron Chancellor, Bismarck of Imperial Germany. The Sunday Times covered the Red Star article the next day, and Thatcher embraced the epithet a week later. In a speech to Finchley Conservatives, she compared it to the Duke of Wellington's nickname, the Iron Duke. The metaphorical sobriquet followed her throughout her political career, and has since become a generic descriptor for strong willed female politicians. Topic. Premiership of the United Kingdom, 1979-1990 Thatcher became Prime Minister on 4 May 1979. Arriving at Downing Street she said, paraphrasing the misattributed prayer of St. Francis, Thatcher was to remain in office throughout the 1980s. For most of her premiership, she was described as the most powerful woman in the world. Topic. Domestic affairs Thatcher was leader of the opposition and prime minister at a time of increased racial tension in Britain. 
Commenting on the local elections of 1977, the Economist noted, "...the Tory tide swamped the smaller parties." That specifically includes the National Front (NF), which suffered a clear decline from last year. Her standing in the polls rose by 11% after a January 1978 interview for World in Action, in which she said, "The British character has done so much for democracy, for law, and done so much throughout the world that if there is any fear that it might be swamped, people are going to react and be rather hostile to those coming in," as well as. In many ways, minorities add to the richness and variety of this country. The moment the minority threatens to become a big one, people get frightened. In the 1979 general election, the Conservatives attracted voters from the NF, whose support almost collapsed. In a meeting in July 1979 with Foreign Secretary Lord Carrington and Home Secretary William Whitelaw she objected to the number of Asian immigrants, in the context of limiting the total of Vietnamese boat people allowed to settle in the UK to fewer than 10,000 over two years. As Prime Minister, Thatcher met weekly with Queen Elizabeth II to discuss government business, and their relationship came under close scrutiny. Her biographer John Campbell writes, One question that continued to fascinate the public about the phenomenon of a woman prime minister was how she got on with the Queen. The answer is that their relations were punctiliously correct, but there was little love lost on either side. As two women of very similar age, Mrs. Thatcher was six months older, occupying parallel positions at the top of the social pyramid, one the head of government, the other head of state, they were bound to be in some sense rivals. Mrs. Thatcher's attitude to the Queen was ambivalent. On the one hand she had an almost mystical reverence for the institution of the monarchy, she always made sure that Christmas dinner was finished in time for everyone to sit down solemnly to watch the Queen's broadcast. Yet at the same time she was trying to modernise the country and sweep away many of the values and practices which the monarchy perpetuated. Michael Shea, the Queen's press secretary, had reportedly leaked anonymous rumours of a rift, which were officially denied by William Heseltine, the private secretary to the sovereign. Thatcher later wrote, I always found the Queen's attitude towards the work of the government absolutely correct. Stories of clashes between two powerful women were just too good not to make up. Topic. Economy and taxation Thatcher's economic policy was influenced by monetarist thinking and economists such as Milton Friedman and Alan Walters. Together with Chancellor of the Exchequer Geoffrey Howe, she lowered direct taxes on income and increased indirect taxes. She increased interest rates to slow the growth of the money supply and thereby lower inflation, introduced cash limits on public spending, and reduced expenditure on social services such as education and housing. Cuts to higher education resulted in her becoming the first Oxford-educated post-war prime minister without an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. After a 738 to 319 vote of the governing assembly and a student petition, her new centrally funded city technology colleges did not achieve much success, and the funding agency for schools was set up to control expenditure by opening and closing schools. A right-wing think tank described it as having an extraordinary range of dictatorial powers. Some Heathite conservatives in the cabinet, the so-called wets, expressed doubt over Thatcher's policies. The 1981 England riots resulted in the British media discussing the need for a policy U-turn. At the 1980 Conservative Party conference, Thatcher addressed the issue directly, with a speech written by the playwright Ronald Miller that included the lines, You turn if you want to. The lady's not for turning. Thatcher's job approval rating fell to 23% by December 1980, lower than recorded for any previous prime minister. As the recession of the early 1980s deepened, she increased taxes, despite concerns expressed in a March 1981 statement signed by 364 leading economists, which argued there was no basis in economic theory for the government's belief that by deflating demand they will bring inflation permanently under control adding that, "...present policies will deepen the depression, erode the industrial base of our economy and threaten its social and political stability." By 1982, the UK began to experience signs of economic recovery, inflation was down to 8.6% from a high of 18%, but unemployment was over 3 million for the first time since the 1930s. 
By 1983, overall economic growth was stronger, and inflation and mortgage rates had fallen to their lowest levels in 13 years. Although manufacturing employment as a share of total employment fell to just over 30%, with total unemployment remaining high, peaking at 3.3 million in 1984. During the 1982 Conservative Party conference, Thatcher said, We have done more to roll back the frontiers of socialism than any previous Conservative government. She claimed at the party conference the following year that the British people had completely rejected state socialism and understood, "...the state has no source of money other than money which people earn themselves. There is no such thing as public money, there is only taxpayers' money." By 1987, unemployment was falling, the economy was stable and strong and inflation was low. Opinion polls showed a comfortable conservative lead, and local council election results had also been successful, prompting Thatcher to call a general election for the 11th of June that year, despite the deadline for an election still being 12 months away. The election saw Thatcher re elected for a third successive term. Thatcher had been firmly opposed to British membership of the Exchange Rate Mechanism, ERM, a precursor to European Monetary Union, believing that it would constrain the British economy. Despite the urging of both her Chancellor of the Exchequer Nigel Lawson and Foreign Secretary Geoffrey Howe, in October 1990 she was persuaded by John Major, Lawson's successor as Chancellor, to join the ERM at what proved to be too high a rate. Thatcher reformed local government taxes by replacing domestic rates a tax based on the nominal rental value of a home with the community charge or poll tax in which the same amount was charged to each adult resident. The new tax was introduced in Scotland in 1989 and in England and Wales the following year, and proved to be among the most unpopular policies of her premiership. Public disquiet culminated in a 70,000 to 200,000 strong demonstration in London in March 1990. The demonstration around Trafalgar Square deteriorated into riots, leaving 113 people injured and 340 under arrest. The community charge was abolished in 1991 by her successor, John Major. It has since transpired that Thatcher herself had failed to register for the tax, and was threatened with financial penalties if she did not return her form. Topic. Industrial relations Thatcher believed that the trade unions were harmful to both ordinary trade unionists and the public. She was committed to reducing the power of the unions, whose leadership she accused of undermining parliamentary democracy and economic performance through strike action. Several unions launched strikes in response to legislation introduced to limit their power, but resistance eventually collapsed. Only 39% of union members voted Labour in the 1983 general election. According to the BBC in 2004, Thatcher "...managed to destroy the power of the trade unions for almost a generation." The miners' strike of 1984–85 was the biggest and most devastating confrontation between the unions and the government under Thatcher. In March 1984, the National Coal Board (NCB) proposed to close 20 of the 174 state-owned mines and cut 20,000 jobs out of 187,000. Two-thirds of the country's miners, led by the National Union of Mine Workers (NUM) under Arthur Scargill, downed tools in protest. However, Scargill refused to hold a ballot on the strike, having previously lost three ballots on a national strike in January and October 1982, and March 1983. This led to the strike being declared illegal by the High Court of Justice. Thatcher refused to meet the union's demands and compared the miners' dispute to the Falklands War, declaring in a speech in 1984, We had to fight the enemy without in the Falklands. We always have to be aware of the enemy within, which is much more difficult to fight and more dangerous to liberty." Although Thatcher had only described the miners' leaders and left-wing authorities as the "...enemy within," her opponents quickly misrepresented it as a reference to all miners and as a sign that she showed contempt for the organized working class. Consequently, the phrase was forever used against her. After a year out on strike, in March 1985 the NUM leadership conceded without a deal. The cost to the economy was estimated to be at least £1.5 billion, and the strike was blamed for much of the pound's fall against the US dollar. Thatcher reflected on the end of the strike by saying that, if anyone has won, it was, the miners who stayed at work, and all those, that have kept Britain going. 
The government closed 25 unprofitable coal mines in 1985, and by 1992 a total of 97 mines had been closed, those that remained were privatized in 1994. The resulting closure of 150 coal mines, some of which were not losing money, resulted in the loss of tens of thousands of jobs and had the effect of devastating entire communities. Strikes had helped bring down Heath's government, and Thatcher was determined to succeed where he had failed. Her strategy of preparing fuel stocks, appointing hardliner Ian McGregor as NCB leader, and ensuring that police were adequately trained and equipped with riot gear, contributed to her triumph over the striking miners. The number of stoppages across the UK peaked at 4,583 in 1979, when more than 29 million working days had been lost. In 1984, the year of the miners' strike, there were 1,221, resulting in the loss of more than 27 million working days. Stoppages then fell steadily throughout the rest of Thatcher's premiership. In 1990, there were 630 and fewer than 2 million working days lost, and they continued to fall thereafter. Thatcher's tenure also witnessed a sharp decline in trade union density, with the percentage of workers belonging to a trade union falling from 57.3% in 1979 to 49.5% in 1985. In 1979 up until Thatcher's final year in office, trade union membership also fell, from 13.5 million in 1979 to fewer than 10 million. Privatization. The policy of privatization has been called a crucial ingredient of Thatcherism. After the 1983 election the sale of state utilities accelerated, more than £29 billion was raised from the sale of nationalized industries, and another £18 billion from the sale of council houses. The process of privatization, especially the preparation of nationalized industries for privatization, was associated with marked improvements in performance, particularly in terms of labor productivity. Some of the privatized industries, including gas, water, and electricity, were natural monopolies for which privatization involved little increase in competition. The privatized industries that demonstrated improvement sometimes did so while still under state ownership. British Steel Corporation had made great gains in profitability while still a nationalised industry under the government-appointed McGregor chairmanship, which faced down trade union opposition to close plants and have the workforce. Regulation was also significantly expanded to compensate for the loss of direct government control, with the foundation of regulatory bodies such as Oftel 1984, Ofgas 1986, and the National Rivers Authority 1989. There was no clear pattern to the degree of competition, regulation, and performance among the privatized industries. In most cases, privatization benefited consumers in terms of lower prices and improved efficiency, but results overall have been mixed. Not all privatized companies have had successful share price trajectories in the longer term. A 2010 review by the Institute of Economic Affairs states. It does seem to be the case that once competition and or effective regulation was introduced, performance improved markedly. But I hasten to emphasize again that the literature is not unanimous." Thatcher always resisted privatizing British Rail and was said to have told Transport Secretary Nicholas Ridley, "...railway privatization will be the Waterloo of this government. Please never mention the railways to me again." Shortly before her resignation in 1990, she accepted the arguments for privatization, which her successor John Major implemented in 1994. The privatization of public assets was combined with financial deregulation in an attempt to fuel economic growth. Chancellor Geoffrey Howe abolished the UK's exchange controls in 1979, which allowed more capital to be invested in foreign markets, and the Big Bang of 1986 removed many restrictions on the London Stock Exchange. Northern Ireland In 1980 and 1981, Provisional Irish Republican Army and Irish National Liberation Army prisoners in Northern Ireland's Mays Prison carried out hunger strikes in an effort to regain the status of political prisoners that had been removed in 1976 by the preceding Labour government. Bobby Sands began the 1981 strike, saying that he would fast until death unless prison inmates won concessions over their living conditions. Thatcher refused to countenance a return to political status for the prisoners, having declared, Crime is crime is crime, it is not political. 
Nevertheless, the British government privately contacted Republican leaders in a bid to bring the hunger strikes to an end. After the deaths of Sands and nine others, the strike ended. Some rights were restored to paramilitary prisoners, but not official recognition of political status. Violence in Northern Ireland escalated significantly during the hunger strikes. Thatcher narrowly escaped injury in an IRA assassination attempt at a Brighton hotel early in the morning on 12 October 1984. Five people were killed, including the wife of Minister John Wackham. Thatcher was staying at the hotel to prepare for the Conservative Party conference, which she insisted should open as scheduled the following day. She delivered her speech as planned, though rewritten from her original draft, in a move that was widely supported across the political spectrum and enhanced her popularity with the public. On 6 November 1981, Thatcher and Irish Taisha Garrett Fitzgerald had established the Anglo Irish Intergovernmental Council, a forum for meetings between the two governments. On 15 November 1985, Thatcher and Fitzgerald signed the Hillsborough Anglo-Irish Agreement, which marked the first time a British government had given the Republic of Ireland an advisory role in the governance of Northern Ireland. In protest, the Ulster Says No movement led by Ian Paisley attracted 100,000 to a rally in Belfast. Ian Gow, later assassinated by the PIRA, resigned as Minister of State in the Hum Treasury, and all 15 Unionist MPs resigned their parliamentary seats. Only one was not returned in the subsequent by elections on 23 January 1986. <laughs> environment Thatcher supported an active climate protection policy and was instrumental in the passing of the Environmental Protection Act 1990, the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and in founding the Hadley Center for Climate Research and Prediction. She helped to put climate change, acid rain and general pollution in the British mainstream in the late 1980s, and in 1989 she called for a global treaty on climate change. Her speeches included one to the Royal Society on 27 September 1988 and to the UN General Assembly in November 1989. However, following her retirement as Prime Minister in 1990, she became skeptical about climate change policy and rejected climate alarmism. <laughs> <laughs> Foreign affairs Thatcher appointed Lord Carrington, a senior member of the party and former Minister of Defence, as Foreign Minister in 1979. Although he was considered a wet, he avoided domestic affairs and got along well with Thatcher. The first issue was what to do with Rhodesia, where the 5% white population was determined to rule the prosperous, largely black ex-colony in the face of overwhelming international disapproval. After the collapse of the Portuguese Empire in Africa in 1975, South Africa, which had been Rhodesia's chief supporter, realized that country was a liability. Black rule was inevitable, and Carrington brokered a peaceful solution at the Lancaster House Conference in December 1979, attended by Rhodesian Prime Minister Ian Smith, as well as the key black leaders, Abel Muzoriwa, Robert Mugabe, Joshua Nkomo and Josiah Tongogara. The conference ended the Rhodesian Bush War. The end result was the new nation of Zimbabwe under black rule in 1980. Topic: Cold War. Thatcher's first foreign policy crisis came with the 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. She condemned the invasion, said it showed the bankruptcy of a détente policy, and helped convince some British athletes to boycott the 1980 Moscow Olympics. She gave weak support to U.S. President Jimmy Carter who tried to punish the USSR with economic sanctions. Britain's economic situation was precarious, and most of NATO was reluctant to cut trade ties. The Financial Times reported that her government had secretly supplied Saddam Hussein with military equipment since 1981. Thatcher and her government backed the Khmer Rouge keeping their seat in the UN after they were ousted from power in Cambodia by the Cambodian-Vietnamese War. Although Thatcher denied it at the time, it was revealed in 1991 that from 1983 the SAS was sent to secretly train the non-communist members of the CGDK to fight against the Vietnamese-backed Kampuchea PRK government. The non-communist members, such as the Sihanoukists and the Khmer People's National Liberation Front, were dominated, diplomatically and militarily, by the Khmer Rouge. It was reported that the SAS had taught 
The use of improvised explosive devices, booby traps and the manufacture and use of time delay devices", in what activist Ray McGrath denounced as, "...a criminally irresponsible and cynical policy." Thatcher was one of the first Western leaders to respond warmly to reformist Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Following Reagan-Gorbachev summit meetings and reforms enacted by Gorbachev in the USSR, she declared in November 1988 that, "...we're not in a Cold War now," but rather in a "...new relationship much wider than the Cold War ever was." She went on a state visit to the Soviet Union in 1984 and met with Gorbachev and Council of Ministers Chairman Nikolai Ryzkov. Topic. Ties with the U.S. Thatcher became closely aligned with the Cold War policies of U.S. President Ronald Reagan, based on their shared distrust of communism. A disagreement came in 1983 when Reagan did not consult with her on the invasion of Grenada. During her first year as Prime Minister she supported NATO's decision to deploy U.S. nuclear crews and Pershing II missiles in Western Europe, permitting the U.S. to station more than 160 cruise missiles at RAF Greenham Common, starting on 14 November 1983 and triggering mass protests by the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. She bought the Trident nuclear missile submarine system from the U.S. to replace Polaris, tripling the U.K.'s nuclear forces at an eventual cost of more than £12 billion at 1996–97 prices. Thatcher's preference for defence ties with the U.S. was demonstrated in the Westland Affair of 1985–86, when she acted with colleagues to allow the struggling helicopter manufacturer Westland to refuse a takeover offer from the Italian firm Augusta in favour of the management's preferred option, a link with Sikorsky aircraft. Defense Secretary Michael Heseltine, who had supported the Augusta deal, resigned from the government in protest. In April 1986, she permitted US F 111s to use Royal Air Force bases for the bombing of Libya in retaliation for the alleged Libyan bombing of a Berlin discotheque, citing the right of self defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Polls suggested that fewer than one in three British citizens approved of her decision. Thatcher was in the U.S. on a state visit when Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein invaded neighboring Kuwait in August 1990. During her talks with President George H. W. Bush, who succeeded Reagan in 1989, she recommended intervention and put pressure on Bush to deploy troops in the Middle East to drive the Iraqi army out of Kuwait. Bush was apprehensive about the plan, prompting Thatcher to remark to him during a telephone conversation. This was no time to go wobbly. Thatcher's government supplied military forces to the international coalition in the build-up to the Gulf War, but she had resigned by the time hostilities began on 17 January 1991. She applauded the coalition victory as a backbencher, while warning that, "...the victories of peace will take longer than the battles of war." It was later disclosed that Thatcher suggested threatening Saddam with chemical weapons after the invasion of Kuwait. Topic. Crisis in the Falklands On 2 April 1982 the ruling military junta in Argentina ordered the invasion of the British possessions of the Falkland Islands and South Georgia, triggering the Falklands War. The subsequent crisis was a defining moment of her Thatcher's premiership. At the suggestion of Harold Macmillan and Robert Armstrong, she set up and chaired a small war cabinet formerly called ODSA, Overseas and Defense Committee, South Atlantic to oversee the conduct of the war, which by 5–6 April had authorized and dispatched a naval task force to retake the islands. Argentina surrendered on 14 June and Operation Corporate was hailed a success, notwithstanding the deaths of 255 British servicemen and three Falkland Islanders. Argentine fatalities totaled 649, half of them after the nuclear-powered submarine HMS Conqueror torpedoed and sank the cruiser era General Belgrano on 2 May Thatcher was criticized for the neglect of the Falklands defense that led to the war, and especially by Tam Daliel in Parliament for the decision to torpedo the General Belgrano, but overall she was considered a highly capable and committed war leader. The Falklands Factor an economic recovery beginning early in 1982, and a bitterly divided opposition all contributed to Thatcher's second election victory in 1983. Thatcher frequently referred after the war to the Falklands spirit, 
Journalists Max Hastings and Simon Jenkins suggested in 1983 that this reflected her preference for the streamlined decision-making of her war cabinet over the painstaking deal-making of peacetime cabinet government. Topic. Negotiating Hong Kong In September 1982 she visited China to discuss with Deng Xiaoping the sovereignty of Hong Kong after 1997. China was the first communist state Thatcher had visited and she was the first British Prime Minister to visit China. Throughout their meeting, she sought the PRC's agreement to a continued British presence in the territory. Deng insisted that the PRC's sovereignty on Hong Kong was non-negotiable, but stated his willingness to settle the sovereignty issue with the British government through formal negotiations, and both governments promised to maintain Hong Kong's stability and prosperity. After the two-year negotiations, Thatcher conceded to the PRC government and signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration in Beijing in 1984, agreeing to hand over Hong Kong's sovereignty in 1997. Topic. Apartheid in South Africa Despite saying that she was in favor of peaceful negotiations to end apartheid, Thatcher opposed sanctions imposed on South Africa by the Commonwealth and the European Economic Community EEC. She attempted to preserve trade with South Africa while persuading the government there to abandon apartheid. This included C. asking herself as President Botha's candid friend and inviting him to visit the UK in 1984, in spite of the inevitable demonstrations against his government. Alan Maridou of the Canadian broadcaster BCTV News asked Thatcher what her response was to a reported ANC statement that they will target British firms in South Africa, to which she later replied, When the ANC says that they will target British companies, this shows what a typical terrorist organization it is. I fought terrorism all my life and if more people fought it, and we were all more successful, we should not have it and I hope that everyone in this hall will think it is right to go on fighting terrorism." During his visit to Britain five months after his release from prison, Nelson Mandela praised Thatcher, "...she is an enemy of apartheid. We have much to thank her for." Topic. Europe Thatcher and her party supported British membership of the EEC in the 1975 national referendum, but she believed that the role of the organisation should be limited to ensuring free trade and effective competition, and feared that the EEC's approach was at odds with her views on smaller government and deregulation. Her opposition to further European integration became more pronounced during her premiership and particularly after her third election victory in 1987. During a 1988 speech in Bruges she outlined her opposition to proposals from the EEC, forerunner of the European Union, for a federal structure and increased centralization of decision-making. She said. We have not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain, only to see them reimposed at a European level, with a European super state exercising a new dominance from Brussels. Thatcher, sharing the concerns of French President Francois Mitterrand, was initially opposed to German reunification, telling Gorbachev that it would lead to a change to post war borders, and we cannot allow that because such a development would undermine the stability of the whole international situation and could endanger our security. She expressed concern that a united Germany would align itself more closely with the Soviet Union and move away from NATO. In March 1990, West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl reassured Thatcher that he would keep her informed of all his intentions about unification and that he was prepared to disclose matters which even his cabinet would not know. In November 1989, Thatcher hailed the fall of the Berlin Wall as a great day for freedom. Topic. Challenges to leadership and resignation Thatcher was challenged for the leadership of the Conservative Party by the little-known backbench MP Sir Anthony Meyer in the 1989 leadership election. Of the 374 Conservative MPs eligible to vote, 314 voted for Thatcher and 33 for Meyer. Her supporters in the party viewed the result as a success, and rejected suggestions that there was discontent within the party. During her premiership, Thatcher had the second lowest average approval rating 40 of any post war prime minister. 
Since the resignation of Nigel Lawson as Chancellor in October 1989, polls consistently showed that she was less popular than her party. A self-described conviction politician, Thatcher always insisted that she did not care about her poll ratings and pointed instead to her unbeaten election record. Opinion polls in September 1990 reported that Labour had established a 14% lead over the Conservatives, and by November the Conservatives had been trailing Labour for 18 months. These ratings, together with Thatcher's combative personality and tendency to override collegiate opinion, contributed to discontent within her party. Thatcher removed Geoffrey Howe as Foreign Secretary in July 1989 after he and Lawson had forced her to agree to a plan for Britain to join the European Exchange Rate Mechanism ERM. Britain joined the ERM in October 1990. On 1 November 1990, Howe, by then the last remaining member of Thatcher's original 1979 cabinet, resigned from his position as Deputy Prime Minister, ostensibly over her open hostility to moves towards European Monetary Union. In his resignation speech on 13 November, Howe commented on Thatcher's openly dismissive attitude to the government's proposal for a new European currency competing against existing currencies, a hard AQ. How on earth are the Chancellor and the Governor of the Bank of England, commending the hard AQ as they strive to, to be taken as serious participants in the debate against that kind of background noise? I believe that both the Chancellor and the Governor are cricketing enthusiasts, so I hope that there is no monopoly of cricketing metaphors. It is rather like sending your opening batsmen to the crease only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. Howe's resignation hastened the end to Thatcher's premiership. On 14 November, Michael Heseltine mounted a challenge for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Opinion polls had indicated that he would give the Conservatives a national lead over Labour. Although Thatcher led on the first ballot with the votes of 204 Conservative MPs 54.8% to 152 votes 40.9% for Heseltine and 16 abstentions, she was four votes short of the required 15% majority. A second ballot was therefore necessary. Thatcher initially declared her intention to fight on and fight to win. The second ballot, but consultation with her cabinet persuaded her to withdraw. After holding an audience with the Queen, calling other world leaders, and making one final common speech, on 28 November she left Downing Street in tears. She reportedly regarded her ousting as a betrayal. Her resignation was a shock to many outside Britain, with foreign observers such as Henry Kissinger and Gorbachev privately expressing consternation. Thatcher was replaced as Prime Minister and Party Leader by Chancellor John Major, who prevailed over Heseltine in the subsequent ballot. Major oversaw an upturn in Conservative support in the 17 months leading to the 1992 general election and led the party to a fourth successive victory on 9 April 1992. Thatcher favoured Major in the leadership contest, but her support for him waned in later years. <laughs> later life Thatcher returned to the backbenches as a constituency parliamentarian after leaving the premiership. Her domestic approval rating recovered after her resignation. The balance of public opinion was that her government had been good for the country. Aged 66, she retired from the House at the 1992 general election, saying that leaving the Commons would allow her more freedom to speak her mind. Post-Commons, 1992–2003 Upon leaving the House of Commons, Thatcher became the first former Prime Minister to set up a foundation. The British wing of the Margaret Thatcher Foundation was dissolved in 2005 due to financial difficulties. She wrote two volumes of memoirs, The Downing Street Years and The Path to Power in 1991 she and her husband Dennis moved to a house in Chester Square, a residential garden square in central London's Belgravia district. Thatcher was hired by the tobacco company Philip Morris as a geopolitical consultant in July 1992, for $250,000 per year and an annual contribution of $250,000 to her foundation. Thatcher earned $50,000 for each speech she delivered. In August 1992, she called for NATO to stop the Serbian assault on Gorazda and Sarajevo to end ethnic cleansing during the Bosnian War. In an op ed, she compared the situation in Bosnia Herzegovina to the worst excesses of the Nazis and warned that there could be a Holocaust. She was an advocate of Croatian and Slovenian independence. 
In a 1991 interview for Croatian radio television, Thatcher commented on the Yugoslav Wars. She was critical of Western governments for not recognizing the breakaway republics of Croatia and Slovenia as independent states and for not supplying them with armaments after the Serbian led Yugoslav army attacked. She made a series of speeches in the Lords criticizing the Maastricht Treaty, describing it as a treaty too far, and stated, I could never have signed this treaty. She cited A. V. Dicey when arguing that, as all three main parties were in favor of the the treaty, the people should have their say in a referendum. Thatcher served as honorary chancellor of the College of William and Mary in Virginia from 1993 to 2000, while also serving as chancellor of the private University of Buckingham from 1992 to 1998, a university she had formally opened in 1976 as the former education secretary. After Tony Blair's election as Labour Party leader in 1994, Thatcher praised Blair as probably the most formidable Labour leader since Hugh Gateskill, adding, I see a a lot of socialism behind their front bench, but not in Mr. Blair. I think he genuinely has moved, Blair responded in kind, she was a thoroughly determined person, and that is an admirable quality. In 1998, Thatcher called for the release of former Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet when Spain had him arrested and sought to try him for human rights violations. She cited the help he gave Britain during the Falklands War. In 1999, she visited him while he was under house arrest near London. Pinochet was released in March 2000 on medical grounds by Home Secretary Jack Straw. At the 2001 general election, Thatcher supported the Conservative campaign, as she had done in 1992 and 1997, and in the Conservative leadership election following its defeat, she endorsed Ian Duncan Smith over Kenneth Clark. In 2002 she encouraged George W. Bush to aggressively tackle the unfinished business of Iraq under Saddam Hussein, and praised Blair for his strong, bold leadership in standing with Bush in the Iraq War. She broached the same subject in her statecraft, Strategies for a Changing World, which was published in April 2002 and dedicated to Ronald Reagan, writing that there would be no peace in the Middle East until Saddam Hussein was toppled. Her book also said that Israel must trade land for peace, and that the European Union EU was a fundamentally unreformable, classic utopian project, a monument to the vanity of intellectuals, a program whose inevitable destiny is failure. She argued that Britain should renegotiate its terms of membership or else leave the EU and join the North American Free Trade Area. Following several small strokes she was advised by her doctors not to engage in further public speaking. In March 2002 she announced that on doctor's advice she would cancel all planned speaking engagements and accept no more. On 26 June 2003, Thatcher's husband Sir Dennis died of pancreatic cancer, and was cremated on 3 July. Topic final years, 2003-2013 On the 11th of June 2004, Thatcher against doctor's orders attended the state funeral service for Ronald Reagan. She delivered her eulogy via videotape. In view of her health, the message had been pre recorded several months earlier. Thatcher flew to California with the Reagan entourage and attended the memorial service and interment ceremony for the president at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. In 2005, Thatcher criticized the way the decision to invade Iraq had been made two years previously. Although she still supported the intervention to topple Saddam Hussein, she said that, as a scientist, she would always look for facts, evidence and proof," before committing the armed forces. She celebrated her 80th birthday on 13 October at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Hyde Park, London. Guests included the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Alexandra and Tony Blair. Lord Geoffrey Howe of Aberavon was also in attendance and said of Thatcher. Her real triumph was to have transformed not just one party but two, so that when Labour did eventually return, the great bulk of Thatcherism was accepted as irreversible." Thatcher's daughter Carol first revealed that her mother had dementia in 2005, saying, "'Mum doesn't read much anymore because of her memory loss.'" In her 2008 memoir, Carol wrote that her mother, "'could hardly remember the beginning of a sentence by the time she got to the end. She later recounted how she was first struck by her mother's dementia when, in conversation, Thatcher confused the Falklands and Yugoslav conflicts. She recalled the pain of needing to tell her mother repeatedly that her husband Dennis was dead. In 2006, Thatcher attended the official Washington, D.C. memorial service to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the 11th of September attacks on the U.S. She was a guest of Vice President Dick Cheney, and met Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice during her visit. 
In February 2007 Thatcher became the first living British Prime Minister to be honoured with a statue in the Houses of Parliament. The bronze statue stands opposite that of her political hero, Sir Winston Churchill, and was unveiled on 21 February 2007 with Thatcher in attendance. She remarked in the members' lobby of the Commons, I might have preferred iron, but bronze will do. It won't rust. Thatcher was a public supporter of the Prague Declaration on European Conscience and Communism and the resulting Prague process, and sent a public letter of support to its preceding conference. After collapsing at a House of Lords dinner, Thatcher, suffering low blood pressure, was admitted to St. Thomas's Hospital in central London on 7 March 2008 for tests. In 2009, she was hospitalised again when she fell and broke her arm. Thatcher returned to 10 Downing Street in late November 2009 for the unveiling of an official portrait by artist Richard Stone, an unusual honour for a living former Prime Minister. Stone was previously commissioned to paint portraits of the Queen and Queen Mother. On 4 July 2011, Thatcher was to attend a ceremony for the unveiling of a 10 feet meters statue to Ronald Reagan, outside the U.S. Embassy in London, but was unable to attend due to her frail health. She last attended a sitting of the House of Lords on 19 July 2010, and on 30 July 2011 it was announced that her office in the Lords had been closed. Earlier that month, Thatcher was named the most competent Prime Minister of the past 30 years in an Ipsos Mori poll. Topic. Death and funeral, 2013 Baroness Thatcher died on 8 April 2013, at the age of 87, after suffering a stroke. She had been staying at a suite in the Ritz Hotel in London since December 2012 after having difficulty with stairs at her Chester Square home in Belgravia. Her death certificate listed the primary causes of death as a cerebrovascular accident and repeated transient ischemic attack. Secondary causes were listed as a carcinoma of the bladder and dementia. Reactions to the news of Thatcher's death were mixed across the UK, ranging from tributes lauding her as Britain's greatest ever peacetime prime minister to public celebrations of her death and expressions of hatred and personalised vitriol. Details of Thatcher's funeral had been agreed with her in advance. She received a ceremonial funeral, including full military honours, with a church service at St Paul's Cathedral on 17 April. Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh attended her funeral, marking only the second time in the Queen's reign that she attended the funeral of any of her former prime ministers, the first and only precedent being that of Winston Churchill, who received a state funeral in 1965. After the service at St Paul's Cathedral, Thatcher's body was cremated at Mortlake Crematorium, where her husband had been cremated. On 28 September, a service for Thatcher was held in the All Saints Chapel of the Royal Hospital Chelsea's Margaret Thatcher Infirmary. In a private ceremony, Thatcher's ashes were interred in the grounds of the hospital, next to those of her husband. <laughs> <laughs> Legacy Political <laughs> <laughs> impact <laughs> 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 Thatcherism represented a systematic and decisive overhaul of the post-war consensus, whereby the major political parties largely agreed on the central themes of Keynesianism, the welfare state, nationalized industry, and close regulation of the economy, and high taxes. Thatcher generally supported the welfare state, while proposing to rid it of abuses, she promised in 1982 that the highly popular National Health Service was safe in our hands. At first she ignored the question of privatizing nationalized industries. Heavily influenced by right-wing think tanks, and especially by Keith Joseph, Thatcher broadened her attack. Thatcherism came to refer to her policies as well as aspects of her ethical outlook and personal style, including moral absolutism, nationalism, interest in the individual, and an uncompromising approach to achieving political goals. Thatcher defined her own political philosophy in a major and controversial break with the One Nation conservatism of Edward Heath and her conservative predecessors in an interview published in Woman's Own magazine, three months after her victory in the 1987 general election, I think we have gone through a period when too many children and people have been given to understand, I have a problem, it is the government's job to cope with it. Or, I have a problem, I will go and get a grant to cope with it. I am homeless, the government must house me. And so they are casting their problems on society and who is society? There is no such thing. 
There are individual men and women and there are families and no government can do anything except through people and people look to themselves first. It is our duty to look after ourselves and then also to help look after our neighbor and life is a reciprocal business and people have got the entitlements too much in mind without the obligations. Topic. Overview The number of adults owning shares rose from 7% to 25% during her tenure, and more than a million families bought their council houses, giving an increase from 55% to 67% in owner-occupiers from 1979 to 1990. The houses were sold at a discount of 33 to 55%, leading to large profits for some new owners. Personal wealth rose by 80% in real terms during the 1980s, mainly due to rising house prices and increased earnings. Shares in the privatized utilities were sold below their market value to ensure quick and wide sales, rather than maximize national income. Thatcher's premiership was also marked by periods of high unemployment and social unrest, and many critics on the left of the political spectrum falter economic policies for the unemployment level. Many of the areas affected by mass unemployment as well as her monetarist economic policies remained blighted for decades, by such social problems as drug abuse and family breakdown. Unemployment did not fall below its 1979 level during her tenure, although in June 1990 the recorded rate 5.4% was lower than the rate in April 1979 5.5%. The long-term effects of her policies on manufacturing remain contentious. Conversing in Scotland in April 2009, Thatcher insisted she had no regrets and was right to introduce the poll tax and withdraw subsidies from outdated industries, whose markets were in terminal decline. Subsidies that created the culture of dependency, which had done such damage to Britain. Political economist Susan Strange termed the new financial growth model, casino capitalism, reflecting her view that speculation and financial trading were becoming more important to the economy than industry. Critics on the left describe her as divisive and claim she condoned greed and selfishness. Welsh politician Rodri Morgan and others have characterised Thatcher as a «marmite» figure. Michael White, writing in The New Statesman, challenged the view that her reforms had brought a net benefit. Others depict her approach as having been «a mixed bag» or «curate's egg». Thatcher did «little to advance the political cause of women», either within her party or the government. Burns states that some British feminists regarded her as «an enemy». June Purvis claims that although Thatcher had struggled laboriously against the sexist prejudices of her day to rise to the top, she made no effort to ease the path for other women. Thatcher did not regard women's rights as requiring particular attention as she did not, especially during her premiership, consider that women were being deprived of their rights. She suggested that women should be shortlisted by default for all public appointments but had once proposed that those with young children ought to leave the workforce. Thatcher's stance on immigration in the late 1970s was perceived as part of a rising racist public discourse, which film critic Martin Barker termed, New Racism. As leader of the opposition, Thatcher believed that the National Front was winning over large numbers of conservative voters with warnings against floods of immigrants. Her strategy was to undermine the front narrative by acknowledging that many of their voters had serious concerns in need of addressing. In January 1978, Thatcher criticized labor immigration policy with the goal of attracting voters away from the front and to the conservatives. Her rhetoric was followed by an increase in conservative support at the expense of the front. Critics on the left reacted in accusing her of pandering to racism. Sociologists Mark Mitchell and Dave Russell responded that Thatcher had been badly misinterpreted, arguing that race was never an important focus of Thatcherism. Throughout her premiership, both major parties took similar positions on immigration policy, having in 1981 passed the British Nationality Act with bipartisan support. There were no policies passed or proposed by her government aimed at restricting immigration, and the subject of race was never highlighted by Thatcher in any of her major speeches as Prime Minister. Many of Thatcher's policies had an influence on the Labour Party, which had returned to power in 1997 under Tony Blair. Blair rebranded the party, New Labour. In 1994 with an aim of increasing its appeal beyond its traditional supporters, and to attract those who had supported Thatcher, such as the Essex Man. She is said to have regarded New Labour as her greatest achievement. Shortly after Thatcher's death, Scottish First Minister Alex Salmond argued that her policies had the unintended consequence 
of encouraging Scottish devolution. Lord Fowlkes of Cumnock agreed on Scotland tonight that she had provided the impetus for devolution. Writing for the Scotsman, Thatcher argued against devolution on the basis that it would eventually lead to Scottish independence. Topic. Reputation Thatcher's tenure of 11 years and 209 days as Prime Minister was the longest since Lord Salisbury 13 years and 252 days, in three spells and the longest continuous period in office since Lord Liverpool 14 years and 305 days. She remains the longest serving Prime Minister officially referred to as such, as the post was only officially given recognition in the order of precedence in 1905, having led her party to general election victories three times in a row twice in landslide. She ranks as the most popular party leader in British history in terms of votes cast for the winning party, with over 40 million ballots cast for the Conservatives in total between 1979 and 1987. Her final election win was hailed as a historic hat trick. By The Independent and other newspapers, Thatcher was voted the fourth greatest British Prime Minister of the 20th century in a poll of 139 academics organised by Maury, and in 2002 she ranked highest among living persons in the BBC poll 100 Greatest Britons. In 1999, Time deemed Thatcher one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century. In 2015 she topped a poll by Scottish Widows, a major financial services company, as the most influential woman of the past 200 years, and in 2016 topped BBC Radio Fa's Woman's Hour Power list of women judged to have had the biggest impact on female lives over the past 70 years. Topic. Cultural depictions According to theatre critic Michael Billington, Thatcher left an emphatic mark on the arts while prime minister one of the earliest satires of thatcher as prime minister involved satirist john wells as writer and performer actress janet brown voicing thatcher and future spitting image producer john lloyd as co-producer who in 1979 were teamed up by producer martin lewis for the satirical audio album the iron lady which consisted of skits and songs satirizing thatcher's rise to power the album was released in September 1979. Thatcher was the subject or the inspiration for 1980s protest songs. Musicians Billy Bragg and Paul Weller helped to form the Red Wedge Collective to support labor in opposition to Thatcher. Known as Maggie by supporters and opponents alike, the chant song, Maggie Out, became a signature rallying cry among the left during the latter half of her premiership. Thatcher was parodied by Wells in several media. He collaborated with Richard Ingrams on the spoof, Dear Bill, letters, which ran as a column in Private Eye magazine. They were also published in book form and became a West End stage review titled Anyone for Dennis, with Wells in the role of Dennis Thatcher. It was followed by a 1982 TV special directed by Dick Clement, in which Thatcher was played by Angela Thorne. Since her resignation as Prime Minister in 1990, Thatcher has been portrayed in a number of television programs, documentaries, films, and plays. She was portrayed by Patricia Hodge in Ian Curtis's long unproduced The Falklands Play 2002 and by Andrea Riseborough in the TV film The Long Walk to Finchley 2008. She is the protagonist in two films, played by Lindsay Duncan in Margaret 2009 and by Meryl Streep in The Iron Lady 2011, in which she is depicted as suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Topic. Titles, awards and honors Thatcher became a Privy Councillor PC upon becoming Secretary of State for Education and Science in 1970. She was the first woman entitled to full membership rights as an honorary member of the Carlton Club on becoming leader of the Conservative Party in 1975. As Prime Minister, Thatcher received two honorary distinctions. The 24th of October 1979, the 24th of October 1979, honorary fellowship, Hun, of the Royal Institute of Chemistry, Frick, which was merged into the Royal Society of Chemistry, FRSC, the following year. The 1st of July 1983, the 1st of July 1983, fellowship of the Royal Society, FRS, a point of controversy among some of the then existing fellows. Within two weeks of her resignation, Thatcher was appointed a member of the Order of Merit, OM, by the Queen in December 1990. Her husband Dennis was honored with a hereditary baronetcy at the same time. As the spouse of a baronet, Thatcher was entitled to use the honorific style, 
Lady, an automatically conferred title that she declined to use. She became Lady Thatcher in her own right in 1992 upon her ennoblement. Thatcher was awarded twice in 1991 with the highest civilian awards of the United States and South Africa respectively. The 7th of March 1991, the 7th of March 1991, the Presidential Medal of Freedom on behalf of President George H. W. Bush. The 15th of May 1991, the 15th of May 1991, the Grand Cross of the Order of Good Hope on behalf of President F. W. de Klerk. She was appointed a Dame of the Order of St. John (DSTJ) in July 1991. In the Falklands, Margaret Thatcher Day has been marked each the 10th of January since 1992, commemorating her first visit to the islands in January 1983, six months after the end of the Falklands War in June 1982. Thatcher became a member of the House of Lords in 19. 1992 with a life peerage as Baroness Thatcher, of Kesteven in the county of Lincolnshire. As a peer, Thatcher was entitled to use a personal coat of arms. A second coat of arms was created for Thatcher following her appointment as a Lady Companion of the Order of the Garter in 1995, the highest order of chivalry for women. Despite receiving her own arms, Thatcher sometimes used the royal arms instead of her own contrary to protocol. In the U.S., Thatcher received the Ronald Reagan Freedom Award, and was later designated patron of the Heritage Foundation in 2006, where she established the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Styles of address Authored <laughs> 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 books Thatcher, Margaret 1993. The Downing Street Years. HarperCollins. ISBN 978-0-00-255049-9-1995. The Path to Power. HarperCollins. ISBN 978-0-00-255050-5. CS1 maint, Multiple Names, Authors List link. 2003. Statecraft, Strategies for a Changing World. Harper Perennial. ISBN 978-0-06-095912-8, CS1 maint, multiple names, authors list, link. Topic. See also. Cadby Hall. Economic history of the United Kingdom. List of elected and appointed female heads of state and government. Political History of the United Kingdom 1945 present Social History of the United Kingdom 1945 present Topic References Topic Notes Topic Citations Topic Bibliography Topic. External links Margaret Thatcher Center Margaret Thatcher Foundation Hansard 1803-2005, Contributions in Parliament by Margaret Thatcher Works by or about Margaret Thatcher at Internet Archive Library resources in your library and in other libraries about Margaret Thatcher Works by Margaret Thatcher at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Archival material relating to Margaret Thatcher. UK National Archives. Appearances on C-SPAN. Margaret Thatcher on IMDb. Margaret Thatcher collected news and commentary. The Guardian. Margaret Thatcher collected news and commentary. The New York Times. Portraits of Margaret Thatcher at the National Portrait Gallery, London. Obituary, Margaret Thatcher. BBC News. Archived from the original on 8 April 2013. Val meets Margaret Thatcher. Val meets the VIPs. BBC iPlayer, 7 March 1973. I don't think there will be a woman prime minister in my lifetime. History of Baroness Margaret Thatcher. Gov.uk. Archived from the original on 5 October 2013. Records of the Prime Minister's Office, Correspondence and Papers, 1979–1997. Prem, Series, 19.
National Archives.